Hey folks, I'm one of those layman Pascals, fresh from the integral stage barn where I've been training our new mascot, Jedediah the non-dual mule, to aim his kicks directly for the human prefrontal cortex. But now that I'm here, let me tell you something. You know, I frequently get questions from my fanatical fans saying, Hey layman, you love Nagarjuna, Deleuze, and Whitehead? You're bivouacked in the hinterland between leading-edge philosophy, ecology, and deep spiritual practice. Why don't you have Kaziati Shakti on your show? And in response, I always say the same thing. A lady thinker? <laughs> That'll be the day. But folks, today is that day. So joining me in the liminal salon to see if she can reverse my virulent anti-feminist, anti-Buddhist, and anti-process philosophy of static unities and sheer self-aggrandizement is Kaziati Shakti. Hi, Kazi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> wow, what an intro. Um, a lot of people don't know you. Let's start with the name. Uh, as I understand it, Adi is either something like a jewel or ornament in Hebrew, or first or superior in Sanskrit, and Shakti is the feminine coded embodiment of universal energy or the functional becoming of all things. What the heck does Kazi mean? Yeah, so it's kind of a combination of, um, I guess, my Muslim and Hindu background. Um, and Kazi is from the Islamic side. And uh, that basically um, is used to be more of a title for a kind of role in, in like a um, municipality or a village or anything, usually a legal role. Um, it's kind of ambiguous, but usually it's um, considered a judge or a magistrate sometimes. And it was a family name for a lot of people in the past when those roles were still in place, um, you know, uh, before British colonialism and all the shifting that happened after that. Um, but it, it stayed as a family name and that's what I got Kazi from. And then there's Adi Shakti. And I'm pronouncing it correctly. It doesn't rhyme with Nazi. <laughs> uh, Kazi, yeah, no, it's not Kazi. It's just Kazi. <laughs> Okay. Most people think that they're getting it wrong, but they actually get it right the first time. So, All right. uh, love your backgrounds. Um, you know, I was thinking about this earlier this afternoon, and I thought there's some options about how we go at this conversation. First option is I can throw straight up philosophical questions like, uh, Kazi, does the problematic power asymmetry in the relation of the one to the other get solved by treating the one as ontologically secondary to a primary multiplicity, or are those kinds of metaphysical reversals located in a conceptual territory that has no real effect on the basic psychological, biological, and ideological factors that generate the habits by which humans hold and utilize their underlying concepts and evaluations? So that would be cool. That's one option is to go down that path. That would be that would be cool. I think I caught what you were saying. Okay. What are the other options? Alternatively, I could do like comedy twist philosophy questions like Kazi, given that there may be possibilities to integrate Buddhist deconstructive negative dialectics with Whitehead's reconstructive dialogical panentheism without requiring both to occupy the same domain, what kind of music have you been into lately? <laughs> okay, I like that approach, but you said and four, the, right? Four approaches? Uh, three. I got three in mind. Okay, the third three. one is probably my favorite because I thought maybe we could try to be more human about this and start <laughs> by talking about what we like about people like Deleuze and Whitehead and Nagarjuna and why philosophy of this kind matters to us emotionally, make this all a little bit more personal and let the high wire conceptual stuff uh, crop up naturally if it wants to. Sure. Well, three kind of sounds like a synthesis of the other two to a certain extent. So I'll go with that um, for sure. I mean, uh, I'm excited well, for I'm excited for um, uh, alternative one type questions for sure. But it would be nice to sort of get into there over time. And um, and I'd love to talk about what music I'm listening to, too. So, you know, anything we'll goes. we can circle back to those. Maybe they'll bubble up on their own. Sure. Um. Let's let's take these people we thought about talking about one by one. How did you get into Whitehead and what do you love about him? Mm. Yeah, so um I guess like in in a lot of different ways I've been sort of like spiritually philosophically inclined a little bit um uh but I was mostly an artist my whole life and I would pretty much say that I'm an artist um you know first and foremost that's what I went to school for and um 
Well, I had some intellectualism in like my early days, you know, it was mostly just art. But when I went to art school, um, there was this really fashionable theory going around called object oriented ontology. And I was like, what the heck is that? Why does that sound so interesting? And also, why is everybody talking about it? And why is it that everyone who's kind of pretentious about their work interested in it. It's like, I want to know what these conversations are and if, if it's bullshit or not. So that sort of led me down to a rabbit hole of contemporary philosophy, specifically uh, speculative realism, found out that that's the movement that that's embedded. And so that kind of like uh, made me realize that philosophy was actually so much more than what I thought, that, that was actually a discipline with a history and that all of these grand ideas I thought I was having, you know, people had already and far, far beyond. And so I wanted to catch up. And what was interesting is that I was also exploring, you know, I guess I have to be sort of open about this. I was also exploring psychedelics around the same time. And my idea of the stability of consciousness, you know, really, um, uh, flipped upside down. I saw how much more malleable and moldable it was, um, and, and what possibilities there were for experience um, beyond just like, you know, the usual. And that also kind of, and there's something perhaps about the visual aesthetics uh, of the psychedelic experience that also made me really think a lot about boundaries and, and uh, the blurry lines between them. And I also was struggling a lot with what I felt was sort of the tension between polarities within myself, uh, whether, whether it's um, the fact that I grew, I was born and, and grew up a little bit in um, Bangladesh, but I immigrated here. Also being visibly queer, I um, was not really accepted with my, uh, by my family, but I was um, a little bit more accepted by my peers in the West. So the, the, the tension between West and East was a big thing. And also the tension between my religious upbringing as a Muslim and eventually becoming Buddhist and my own interest in science and reason and logic. And so these tensions. And as I was trying to understand speculative realism by going back and forth in, in inside the uh, a history of philosophy. Um, I also was introduced to Whitehead very early on by uh, two uh, really cool guys, uh, Stephen Shaviro and Matthew David Seagal. Um, they were in the speculative realist space um, using Whitehead as this framework. And I was also, and I'm finally getting around to answering more directly, um, because I was sort of interested in sort of uh, going beyond the tension between these polarities I felt within myself. I saw myself doing the same thing in, in the philosophy I was reading. And um, I started getting interested in panpsychism um, as a sort of philosophical, metaphysical worldview. Um, and um, because it also sort of, you know, found this or, you know, uh, suggests a way, a third or middle way beyond like idealism, materialism. I have different thoughts about that now, but um, that's what eventually brought me to Whitehead and I've been studying uh, Whitehead ever since. And um, um, actually for a long time, it was mostly uh, trying to read what I could to get to the point to read Whitehead. <laughs> but uh, I actually kind of you know, really started with Whitehead early on um, in, in, in wanting to get to the point to reading him and um, Recently, I finally have and um, has been massively incorporating him into into my writing. So nice. I appreciate the psychedelic connection. Uh, I think he did the world he describes is one of the closest images to what it's experientially like to go through entheogenic experiences. <laughs> For sure. I probably first got interested in him through Terence McKenna, the psychedelic philosopher mm. who quoted Whitehead a lot. Right. Um, and I. <clears throat> I would go to my local library, just reread Adventure of Ideas and Process in Reality. And I love him as a, I think he's undervalued as like a prose stylist. He has really oh. long, amazing, sensual sentences of just absolutely strange things that no one else would have put those words together in that sequence. Right. So I love that. There's a pleasure in like reading it aloud to me. And uh, I'm a big Nietzschean. So I love, I see in him so many Nietzschean ideas, but he makes them sound respectable and kind of like domesticated and tidied <laughs> yeah, up. <laughs> sure. And I always just find that I'm in really good spirits around process philosophers. And uh, I think I told this to Matt Segal the last time I talked to him. Process philosophy communities are like uh, 
enclaves that protect contemporary shamans and witches. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, that's, yeah. a, that's an ethical interest of mine. So I'm, I'm happy that they exist to um, make a philosophical housing for people whose instincts I resonate with and think are important to the general conversation. Mm -hmm. Also, I've always been really intrigued by the way he holds the creation of subject and object, right? And how that comes into time and unfolding is a really unique piece of the Whiteheadian approach for me. Right, yeah. This idea of the subject superject um, as, you know, this one unified totality of what we could call a subject and object. Um, and I love this dance he does in terms, in almost obliterating the distinction, but retaining it just enough to be able to have the analytical force that his, you know, his, uh, the his philosophy he has and the ability to describe things as adequately as he can while still respecting yeah that that indivisibility between these these polarities of subject object um, mind matter etc so what about Deleuze what's so cool about Deleuze <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Deleuze is interesting I would say I have sort of two um interests um that are kind of parallel, but I, I'm having recently um, attempt, I made a grand attempt at reading Difference and Repetition is actually my first real Deleuze text. I, I can see how um, his metaphysics uh, does relate to the other thing I'm interested about is his, his politics, his, his kind of interesting um, anarchist or libertarian form of Marxism. I'm really interested in that. And then um, and seeing how his metaphysics plays into that as well. Though I, um, he's been an interest of mine for a while, but um, recently I decided to take a deeper look at him because there's one um, sort of category or one one item in um, in uh, Whitehead's categorical scheme that is very controversial: um, eternal objects, and particularly um, contra uh, you know a interesting thing to uh, work with in a process Buddhist synthesis. You know, um, as a Buddhist, maybe that word "eternal" gives me a little bit of um, uh, the heebie-jeebies, so I have to sort of deal with that and face that and and, and account for for that. Um, you know, account for it in the sense of uh, to what extent does it contradict the um, the understanding of impermanence? That is, you know, one of the central uh, tenets of of, Buddha, of the Buddhist worldview. Um, and so I found Deleuze and his understanding of the virtual, which is a very parallel idea of of, of the of potentiality um, that we find um, in Whitehead through the notion of eternal objects. That whereas eternal objects sort of mediated the the formal character of a being and its activity, um, for Whitehead the virtual and the actual are much more interconnected and there's no third mediating principle that so the, so whereas eternal objects all sort of exist in the comprehensive primordial uh, conception of god the the virtual is sort of more so embedded within the actual and so i find i find this more and and um, the intuition i get is this is a kind of more anarchistic approach to the the question of form and potential than than in whitehead whitehead is very much a a bit of a liberal which is fine but uh, and this this might be one of those places I think where um, Whitehead might not be the most consistent with his uh, you know thesis of or his his view of ubiquitous process. So that's why I turn to Deleuze to to see if he can help me sort of make sense or even modify if I have to this category of eternal objects um, in order to make the synthesis of process Buddhism um, much more consistent and coherent um, and, you know, non-contradictory. So. Wow. That's great. Yeah. Whitehead is, uh, I mean, he seems like a very uh, embedded, respectable English gentleman and right. has the <laughs> political sensibility that goes with that. For sure. And there's a kind of, uh, there's a riskiness in Deleuze, uh, and yes, I, yeah. I relate to it quite a bit because I'm I'm constantly reaching for a different terminology and a different set of concepts to express the phenomenology of the spiritual states and stages that I feel like I'm going through because I feel like unity and infinite and you know there's these words that everybody uses and I'm like ah, it doesn't feel quite right. 
Uh, but to take them out entails this sort of risk. Like, what's how do you continue to value things that you experienced as transcendental if that transcendental is somehow a product of the imminent? Or uh, there's a lot of areas where traditional spiritual people, and Whitehead has a little bit of this, a kind of classicism, and classical mm -hmm. thinkers sort of push back against that risky edge. I got For into sure. those. Uh, maybe I saw even saw him on a French TV show. Uh, the thing called oh, wow. they say there. Uh, it's a French TV show where they get somebody famous and they ask you a question about every letter of the alphabet. So he responds. It's on YouTube. It's great. And he got to S for style, and he said, "Style is that quality possessed by those of whom we say they have no style." <laughs> And I, I thought about that for a long time. And I'm like, okay, I guess if we recognize it as style, it's almost like turned over into a fashion already. And it's mm -hmm. only really style if you're doing something where other people aren't sure what category it's in. Yeah, that's very to lose for sure. <laughs> so I, I loved that. And uh, I started to research him and loved how much he loved Nietzsche and reread, mm -hmm. read and reread Nietzsche and philosophy quite a bit. Really mm -hmm. interested in how he tries to Mm, the distinctions he tries to make around the eternal recurrence and the way he tries to elucidate what he sees as the active and reactive forces in Nietzsche's thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, and also very interested in uh, Deleuze as the, as the trans Foucault in a way, uh, because in a lot of these developmental communities that I'm in, particularly in the integral community, there's a lot of uh, ambivalence about Foucault. Like on the one hand, this respect for him as a as a real philosophical powerhouse, and on the other hand, this worry that he sort of articulated the postmodern trap that we have to get out of, and you know maybe he was emotionally and morally corrupted as well. And there's all this nobody's sure how to hold Foucault, but there's this yeah. sense that there's this other person who really absorbed Foucault and took Foucault seriously, but also kind of maybe solved some of the problems that Foucault hesitated in front of. So I, I love Deleuze as potentially the the post Foucault, um, and I you know that phrase that Foucault said of like maybe the century will be remembered as Deleuzian. I think right. maybe the twenty first century, one way or another, will be characterized by Deleuzian type concepts in the end. Yeah, I totally see that because um, in a way, you know, uh, Whiteheadians often like to characterize Whitehead um, as a, a constructive postmodernist in in contrast to the more deconstructive postmodernists. You can say Derrida and Foucault and maybe Lyotard. And, but I feel like um, Deleuze um, doesn't, uh, you know, might fit more on the constructive side or at least tip towards that um, for sure. So I, I totally see what you say about the the affinity and affiliation between the two, but um, Deleuze might be a little more preferable for someone who wants a, a genuinely constructive approach to to things. Because um, creativity, though, White, though Deleuze doesn't use the term creativity in the way Whitehead does, um, creativity for me, I think, is definitely central in, in Deleuze's metaphysics and his approach to things in general. Yeah, I saw you were working on something around labor and creativity. What's that about? Yeah, so um, uh, every once in a while, me and sometimes some friends, but uh, this time it's me, um, we host and facilitate reading groups around a, a particular book. And we're given a platform by the Cobb Institute, which is um, a small research institute of the Center for Process Studies, um, to basically around a whitehead, um, or not, not just whitehead, but any kind of process book. So when I read uh, Difference in Repetition, it was actually with a, a group of folks um, from the War Machine podcast. Um, and we we read Difference in Repetition together with the Cobb Institute. Um, and before that, we um, also did Process in Reality. Um, and um, so this time we're doing this book called Marx and Whitehead. Um, Process Dialectics and the Critique of Capitalism by Anne Fairchild Pomeroy. And that is looking at basically um, Pomeroy's uh, general thesis in the book is that there is um, <clears throat> a deep resonance and similarity in the way that uh, Marx and Whitehead are dialectical thinkers um, fundamentally, even if the scale at which they are 
um, applying their dialectical reason um, are different. So um, Whitehead, <clears throat> Whitehead is much more broad and probably the broadest possible um, scope, which is metaphysics as such. And Marx is the not just the process of production, but it's very specific historical mode of the process of production of capitalism. But she um, outlines and shows evidence, great evidence for uh, the deep um, structural affinity between the two thinkers and the way that they hold concepts and tensions and, and uphold or, or maintain consistency with the dialectical unity of opposites um, as a dynamic process of development. And um, another element of her, her argument is that um, to really, uh, let's say, um, to really meet the, uh, or to really fulfill the intentions of each thinker, uh, they kind of really need each other. So Marx's critique of political economy would um, just benefit the more by being grounded in a metaphysical framework that, um, you know, uh, like Whitehead's that goes beyond, you know, sort of still continues what uh, Marx is doing in the beginning, transcending the, the dualism between materialism and idealism. But um, there are some sections where uh, Pomeroy discusses how people have tried to interpret that element of Marxist thought through Hegel. And for this or that reason, um, we, we might, it might be due time to look towards someone else to refresh our idea of what Marx was trying to do when he was trying to dialectically advance beyond idealism and materialism. So we benefit from a Marxian, uh, a process inflected Marxist view. But on this flip side, you know, just going back to what we just talked about, about uh, Whitehead being a uh, proper, you know, uh, civil English gentleman and his liberal tendencies, maybe there's something really radical about his metaphysics that are really not, um, uh, you know, being super consistent with what his, you know, political um, sort of orientation may have been, or even the orientation of his followers. And so there, there's a sense of radicality to his metaphysics that needs to be ever more emphasized by grounding it, or not grounding it, but rather showing how it's exemplified in capitalism, but also how capitalism is kind of like a ontological obstruction to the kind of creativity that he is saying is the basis of reality. Um, and so... That, that, that's the the book that we are uh, going to read and explore um with the with the Cobb Institute and it's starting in about two weeks so it'll be for nine weeks good I just this afternoon Jared Morningstar asked me to uh do a thing with Cobb Institute next week so I'm, oh, thrilled. Awesome. And I'm also e eager to know how this conversation in this book turns out because uh when you figure out what a a radical white heady and economic revolution looks like please let us know <laughs> for sure and on the flip side what does a you know us perhaps yeah. a softer more um you know sensitive metaphysically sensitive marxism what does that look like you know that's a really interesting question marx is so there i mean there's so many different in many insights in there right and if you pick and choose the bits you like there's always something good or, or something to hate but the, the whole complex of it and the way that it's linked to these real world Marxist attempts that have this reputation of being failures, it, it's very interesting to wonder if there's some kind of philosophical difference that would have caused a different outcome in those manifestations of Marxism throughout the 20th century. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a huge topic. <laughs> that's, a, that's a rabbit hole in itself we can get into, but... Well, let's first let's check in on uh, Nagarjuna. I mean, you're working mm -hmm. on a synthesis of process Buddhism, a uh, number of different uh, major thinkers and saints and sages in that tradition. I used to live in a Buddhist community myself. Oh, wow. um, why, why Nagarjuna? Why, what makes him so interesting? Yeah, so... I think I'm. I, there's a sense in which I'm going to almost speak circularly um, because I kind of have to. I kind of have to go to the end of why of how Nagarjuna fits into um, uh, process Buddhism with Whitehead to then explain like why you know why I might why we might think of him first. And um, so what what ends up um, happening with the and it's still ongoing 
process. I'm still um, writing and developing my first iteration of what would be my book, um, presenting uh, my uh, expression of process Buddhism. But what we would have at the end is this uh, complex unity between a positive, constructive philosophical framework and a negative dialectical um, supplement. And and to to explain um, either the the positive philosophy is basically um, you know some version of either exactly or some modified along with some modified elements of Whitehead's metaphysical scheme, his terminology, the way we um, can understand and describe reality. Um, so uh, positively, um, and actually, and and actually, uh, sort of taking the information that we collect from the world and combine it or uh, sort through it in different ways to then um, help us uh, reach some sort of end goal that we have in actual practice. Um, but and so, in a sense, Whitehead's form of thinking, Whitehead's system, is kind of self consistent. It can already kind of do that. But um, like I said, um, along with some of my concerns about eternal objects and maybe Whitehead's um, liberalism, there might be ways in which uh, Whitehead might be inconsistent in his idea of um, you know reality being fundamentally processual or the way he articulates the system. And so, for me, the these errors, uh, from a Buddhist point of view, most likely come from some aspect of grasping at a concept or grasping at an element of reality and wanting it to be more stable, more enduring, more ontologically foundational than it actually is. And so Nagarjuna's Madhyamaka um, form of reasoning, um, which consists of um, a, a series of ways of deconstructing ideas um and we can probably go into that a little bit um which and um the main example of this way of thinking um this sort of negative dialectical thinking is nagarjuna's fundamental verses of the middle way the mulamajyamaka karika and what i mean by negative dialectic is that while most people sort of um you know, basic understanding of, of dialectic is that it's sort of the, the play of opposites giving rise to something new. I mean, even that's very simplified. It's um, uh, people like to reduce dialectics to the formula of thesis, antithesis, synthesis, but um, it's a little bit more complicated in people like Hegel. But that aside, people are more so used to a kind of constructive idea of dialectic as something that unfolds novelty through the interplay of um, oppositional forces. Negative dialectic is more of a kind of regressive process, a, a regression. It's not a progression to, to newer and higher orders of synthesis. It's actually dissolving oppositional tendencies to reach a a ground that is the condition for the possibility of the duality that we're dissolving. And so reaching back to a more originary state of, and, and from a Buddhist point of view, this would be going back to a originary state of non-grasping. And that's what, where um, Nagarjuna's analysis, his dialectical analysis is trying to lead us. It's not, you know, perhaps like Hegel, it's not, um, uh, this positive dialectical process of gradually coming towards a more and more comprehensive single total perspective, but it's more about releasing these oppositional con conceptual proliferation. So we reach this more natural state of non-grasping um, that allows us to see the real for, for what it truly is. And so, um, so that is why I choose, um, Oh, sorry. Um, so, the positive philosophy along with the negative dialectics. And the reason why Nagarjuna is because this kind of unity, this kind of complex of Madhyamaka with a positive philosophy has already existed in the history of, of Buddhist philosophy, most famously with uh, Shantarakshita uh, and Kamalashila, um, these two uh, major classical Indian philosophers, they put together um, a synthesis of Yogacara and Madhyamaka. And, and similarly to Whitehead's philosophy, uh, Yogacara, well, Yogacara is, a, is a doctrine of experience from a phenomenological point of view, and it makes some ontological posits. And um, the way Kamala Shila and Chandrakshita put Yogacara and Madhyamaka together is saying Yogacara gives us this sort of positive um, 
system that can act as a manual for practice. Um, but there's also the innate risk of grasping onto things and blocking our enlightenment. So that's where Nagarjuna's Madhyamaka helps us to keep those grasping tendencies at bay by using reason to show that there's nothing to grasp onto. And so then, so then naturally the, so naturally I would choose Nagarjuna because there's already precedent in bringing a positive philosophy along with Nagarjuna. And so Whitehead's um, whole thing being a constructive speculative system of thought, um, Nagarjuna would be um, adequately poised um, to, to supplement him. Because otherwise, what do we have? We have either we have um, just Nagarjuna's system itself, which kind of doesn't even really exist in Buddhism. Um, you don't just read Nagarjuna and do his ana analysis and that's it. You know, it's just always a supplement to embodied yogic or meditative praxis. Um, and it can't be um, necessary from my perspective. You know, I can't just put Yogacara and Whitehead together because then that's, those are two comp almost competing positive constructions. And either I would have to cherry pick which terminology to use or subordinate one to another implicitly or explicitly. And I did not want to um, participate in any kind of I didn't want to reproduce a kind of logic of domination in the way that I would bring the two together, Whitehead and Nagarjuna. I wanted each to be able to be relatively autonomous and independent frameworks um, that can only be, you know, more empowered by bringing them together in, in a kind of partnership, you know, without saying one is more important than the other, because in a way they're doing different things. Um, so you can't really judge them on the same metric, um, but they can be brought together for a, I think, a more powerful, comprehensive, um, you know, way of approaching the world um, in order for us to reach the goals that we have. So he's very well positioned to <laughs> help you with your project. <laughs> yeah, I notice, yeah. um, I probably say like, Nagarjuna versus Nagarjuna. And uh, you know, it's like a hard or soft J, but I'm just hearing it now. The way I say it is probably because there's so much French in Canada that I'm used to pronouncing softer, you know, Nagarjuna. Sounds French to me now that I compare it to the way you're saying it. <laughs> yeah, and I actually had that question too. And uh, I mean, I haven't studied Sanskrit yet, unfortunately. Um, so I'm not quite sure. I've heard people, you know, many different, um, you know, scholars of Nagarjuna also pronounce it differently. It's like Nagarjuna, Nagarjuna, Nagarjuna. I mean, um, I say I say Nagarjuna. I don't know. I'm I'm a Bangladeshi, and so um, maybe some of the way I pronounce things come from that. Um, but I'm butchering things too. So I have a, yeah. I'm always very critical of our failure to translate certain things. Like if you, mm -hmm. uh, you translate the whole Quran into English, but you leave the name of God in Arabic, you're like, that's a little bit suspicious. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a move of some kind. Right. So sure. I always think about like, like, uh, there's like silver or white and snake or serpent in the Garjana. So I, uh, instead of saying Sri Nagarjuna or Nagarjuna, I often say just Lord White Snake. Uh, <laughs> I refer to Song Kappa as Onion Valley Man, or like I want to hear <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, the mythic resonances of the words that the people who spoke the language would have heard. Yeah, for sure. No, I, actually, that's funny. Um, I think like yesterday I was thinking like, huh, like Angulimala literally just means. A necklace of fingers, um, and if people don't if people don't know who I'm referring to, there's just a story of this. Long story short, this mass murderer um, who uh, the Buddha basically stopped and um, uh, sort of forced compelled him to uh, become a, a Buddhist monk, and um, is sort of a story that's an example of like no matter how bad things you've done there's always still the potential for enlightenment within, within you and part of the story is that he would kill people just as a you know murderous maniac and a homicidal maniac and um chop up people's fingers and wear them as a necklace and uh, people called him angulimala which just sounds like uh, just a name but it, it really just means like necklace of fingers angulimala <laughs> and we call him mr finger necklace <laughs> right <laughs> Um, uh, uh, yeah, Nagarjuna, you know, I, I don't know if I think of him 
as as a specific historical character or if I think of him as like the embodiment of the second turning of the wheel in general. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I certainly I love this sense that there was a moment where uh, Buddhism became something that could have esoteric universities or academies mm -hmm. where uh, the principle of loving kindness, in addition to a principle of emptiness, becomes a really prominent thing for inner practice, but also for the uh, like the social ethics of the Buddhists, you know, mm -hmm. like demonstrate compassion to everyone. It creates a really good reputation that Buddhism still has. The two things, though, that I really think a lot about when it comes to him, uh, or first of all, I don't like Song Kappa's. I think the my sense is the English use of a word like emptiness to translate shunyata comes via the Tibetan translation through Song Kappa. Mm -hmm. And I feel like emptiness is a little bit misleading because you end up having to say, well, emptiness is empty of emptiness. And I'm like, well, you wouldn't really have that problem if you defined it as indiscernibility or, you know, there's a number of different conceptual options. My friend mm -hmm. Bruce usually thinks of it as openness or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the, the problem of figuring out what that word meant for Nagarjuna and also like how is, how do we hold the tetralemma, the fourfold logic. You know, I grew up uh, with Western scholars constantly using a fourfold logic to contrast Aristotle's two-value logic. Uh, they mm -hmm. just seemed to think this was the most amazing thing. But when you're invested in like Buddhist practice and when you're invested in like Zen koan work, you have a different sense of what that's supposed to do. Like, is it just a way of spreading out the number of operations that you can do in logic or is it a way of forcing your mind into a particular position that can't be captured here and can't be captured here and can't be captured here but you have to pass from one option to another in order to confront the fact that it's not captured and to me that's that's the significance i sort of think of him as the the originator of the aesthetic that then later becomes the zen koans Right. And he's sort of cited as part of that tradition and the the way the logical structure and the linguistic structure of how koans are packaged, where they're always putting you up against the impossibility of separating sameness and difference. I really feel like he was the one who saw the potential of that and the potential of a the whole prajna equals samadhi kind of movement, that there was a way of thinking that sort of converges with or does the same thing as the best altered states. So I love him for that. Yeah, um, I'm not very familiar. So my practice is based in, in Tibetan Buddhism, and so I'm not super well versed in Zen, but as as far as I understand, Nagarjuna is a original patriarch in a lot of Zen lineages. Yeah, so that makes complete sense for sure um and i like that you you brought up this um this issue of translation of what to translate shunyata as and you know emptiness is the standard translation and then you also mentioned openness um and that's something that i've thought about and wrestled with and so uh what i decided not as like a translator but just noticing that there are these options out there is to um just add a slash. Um, and so I call it open emptiness. So open slash emptiness. And I like the slash because it represents sort of alternative. So it can be openness or emptiness or open emptiness. And so if you have a preference, hopefully one of them is there. And um, at the same time, it um, I think it does help it to, to show both options at the same time. Uh, and I think... Um, and I don't necessarily think either one is inherently better than the other because there 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 are different places where um, there might be more of an emphasis on openness or emptiness, and so emptiness I would say is. Um, a feature of the more analytical mode of meditation where you're actually trying to so you know you first you assume you assume the self. And then you try to find it and you try to find it in all or any of these tetralemical possibilities, as you were saying. And so does it come from itself? Does it come from another? Does it come from both? Does it come from neither? Does it cause, you know, neither being a causally? Is it just spontaneously arisen? And each time, just as you say, you, 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 
you look and investigate and you analyze and you see that there's nothing to grasp onto and then you move from each position. And so emptiness becomes more, um, the sense of emptiness is there because what you're trying to find is not there. So you're empty handed in a way, you're, you can't find what you're looking for. But in the tradition itself has been recognized, uh, you know, all the way down to Nagarjuna, who who said that emptiness wielded um, incorrectly is like um, grasping a snake incorrectly. Um, so very dangerous. And that danger might come from this sort of nihilistic possibility that you can think that, oh, because I can't find anything, there's nothing actually. And, and so openness can sort of counteract that. And um, openness is more of a sense of, well, all these different things that I thought were solidly existing that I can't find, they don't obstruct the space of existence of the, or the space of reality, which is boundless and open and free of all of these fixed determinations, which doesn't mean that there's nothing there. It just means that there, there's this vast freedom um, that 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 we're trying to point to. And yeah, and so that way I think, um, and it's kind of like one of the ways um, maybe that my training as an artist sort of comes in. I'm like very sensitive to like the, the visual um, aspect of text and, and the effect that has. And, and so hopefully doing the open slash emptiness sort of um, gives some of that sense of reminding you of the, the, um, the, the importance of each way of describing or translating um, uh, shunyata, but um, but not necessarily uh, choosing one or having to choose one. And openness is also like, um, there's, there's been some discussion, and I think in the longer form of the um, essay that um, I have out, which is sort of my working manuscript for the book I want to write, there's, um, there's a part where I show that there are some people thinking about openness and giving evidence for op openness being an adequate translation for shunyata. Um, so it's not arbitrary, um, but yeah, so um, open emptiness. There's merits of both, so I, so I thought, why not have them both? Oh, that's great. I love that. There's a there's something you mentioned in there that I really like, which is a kind of, you know, the negative or like the applied ap apophatic form of, mm. of meditation and insight, because it's one thing to try to assert openness or emptiness. It's another thing right. to reach for a boundary or an object and not find it and discover right. its liberating absence, which has, uh, it's a more authentic feeling, a more authentic way to go through the process, I think. Yeah, I always tell people either, you know, to really understand Midyamaka, you either read Nagarjuna or apply an analytic meditation that hopefully, you know, you got an instruction for because, you know, you could, you know, you can maybe go to the Stanford Encyclopedia and it'll give you sort of the list of all the different things that, you know, you might derive from from reading Nagarjuna, but there's, there's nothing that can replace the um the functioning of your own reasoning trying really actually trying to find something and failing um and 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 you have to really try to fail too you can't and and that's sort of the um the sort of danger with being too much of a scholar is that you 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 fix these intellectual ideas and then you sort of have this idea already oh well I mean, why am I doing this exercise? I know that by the end, I'm going to find some, there's not going to be anything findable. And then you don't really go through with it with the force of the analysis. Yeah. And so you really have to be open on to, to doing that. Um, but also at the same time, like once you really have a sense of it, um, you know, uh, you sort of move on from, from, from that just analytical mode. And then you sort of rest in the more open mode um, because it's in there, it's in that open mode where um, just sort of the radiance of your own innate awareness actually starts to shine through. In the analytical mode, that awareness has kind of become contracted and laser focused in order to achieve this sort of exercise and in, in unfindability um but you really need to you know let it go after that after that point of you know really being empty-handed and and allowing you to see now that you've cleared away all of the obstructions uh to see that radiance that was always there and and, and stabilizing in that um yeah yeah my my experience in uh, Zen koan work uh, sort of makes it seem like there are two different approaches. They sound very similar, right? 
but one person could say, oh, right, I'm, I'm over-focused in my analytic mode. I just have to let that go. But another front is like, no, no, you have to push that further to the point where it paradoxically breaks down and then a transformation occurs in your system somehow. So there's a saying, you know, you need a great ball of certainty and a great ball of doubt to do the koan practice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, you know, they have this saying around, uh, you know, Buddha is, Buddha is the same as the mind essence. But the question is, what is the mind essence, right? Is it, is it our idea of the invisible background of thinking? Or is it the process of distinction making itself, uh, which is usually where I come back to, because when you make a distinction, the interesting thing about a distinction is it divides and connects at the same time. So it's like a unit of simultaneous sameness and difference, the way that a, a fence connects and divides two properties. It can't be said to only do one of those functions. And if you keep trying to work that with your mind you eventually you get to this limit condition where your mind explodes and it seems like all questions are answered before you ask them which is i think the uh the little you know zen kensho moments and you're supposed to stockpile as many of these moments as you can to become a different kind of person <laughs> Yeah, and that very much sounds um, a lot like what I was mentioning about how uh, the sort of the, the negative dialectic approach of Nagarjuna is this sort of, um, I mean, maybe regressing is not the right term, but yeah, it is sort of going back to this original state of non-grasping. And it's, it's not this novel uh, sort of new consciousness, you know, it's really almost sort of um, something which precedes consciousness, but even that is a kind of temporal language that's not... Uh, fundamentally applicable in, in the direct experience itself but yeah do you think philosophers um even philosophers like Deleuze and Whitehead suffer from the absence of a more rigorous inner practice or do you think there's something in the way they contemplate the world that does that inner practice for them yeah that's a great question um and I feel like the way I uh, answer will you know it's um, should I do it as a Buddhist exceptionalist or, or more of a, a pluralistic ecumenical type person? Um, or you know, and there, may be, there may be a secret third position there. No, that's a really good question. I mean, I feel like, um, you know, uh, it's hard to really quantify, you know, what, what is the kind of precious karma that keeps you moving towards Buddhahood and what's, what's the type that brings you back and is there a necessary relationship between that kind of good karma and like actually being a buddhist practitioner because you know as as people in the west are you know we're sort of you know buddhists in the west are struggling with is um, one of the things we're struggling with is just sort of this clash of worlds between you know some of the more um you know some more conservative uh you know patriarchal um uh, mentalities with some of the Asian teachers who've come here in the last decades and the more libertarian and individualistic and, and, um, and, um, you know, even and on the positive side, you know, very socially justice oriented uh, people in the West and how sometimes there's a lot of tension between those, those two worlds. And um, there is unfortunately, you know, a, more than a handful of, you know, abuse cases um, in a lot of large institutions. And so, you know, um, and then there's also often the the question of like, um, you know, there's so many of these tulkus who are supposed to be, you know, re, you know, reincarnations of masters in the past whose duty is to, you know, continue with uh, proliferating the Dharma, but then they also, they live like kings and spoil it. And, you know, also the same abusers. And so, um, yeah, I guess appearances can deceive and, you you know, you don't really, you can't really count. Um, there, there's no way to really account for what's, what's the kind of karma that brings, is bringing someone to Buddhahood and what isn't. And, um, yeah, I don't know. And um, I mean, to some extent, uh, it, it would seem if I'm consistent with my own tradition that at some point refuge in the three jewels, <laughs> you know, is a requisite condition for Buddhahood. But um, who's to say that Whitehead and Dullers aren't far off ahead in, in that direction than even I am as a card carrying Buddhist. So, but in terms of, you know, um, you know, I, I mean, I would bet that because I find so much resonance between their philosophies, which is a kind of, you know, extension of their own internal dispositions um, with Buddhism, then I would say, yeah, they, I think they're on the right track. <laughs> I hope, yeah, I hopefully it. I am. <laughs> 
I find it really hard to tell. Like, I, I think about this with Nietzsche a lot. Is there something he mm -hmm. was doing that described differently would count as some form of significant meditation practice or not? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that could be said about a lot of philosophers. And I think there's a tendency since uh, the institution of academic philosophy, uh, maybe even since Aristotle, we might have lost sight of the fact that for a lot of the early philosophers, it was a process to change themselves mm -hmm. and not just mm -hmm. a competition of who's got the best world map. Even Descartes, I think the intense, the tautological intensity of I think, therefore I am, uh, you know, you're like, oh, I can't, I try to think another thing and I can't think my way out of this absolute limit condition of thought, that that's attractive because it does something to your experience of yourself. Yeah, yeah. That's a really good point. And yeah, and I think that, that has a lot to do with um, the way, you know, so much of uh, human knowledge has become uh, turned into disciplines, um, you know, in, in the modern era, and there's positives and negatives with that. And I think, you know, the positive is that, you know, we can sort of allocate attention and resources even more hyper specifically um, in, in these individuated domains. But then the, the problem is that, yeah, some of the interconnections between these disciplines start to get lost and then yeah i mean i love the idea that back in ancient greece there you know there was more of an affinity between physical fitness and philosophizing right and uh there's almost none of that um anymore you know philosophy is an entirely cognitive kind of uh discipline um i mean i think we're kind of slowly I, i'm trying to circle back i think with this sort of explosion of interdisciplinarity transdisciplinarity intra para academia and i think and um you know me being an artist and involving myself in philosophy and um um yeah i, I think we're tr we're trying to circle back but yeah it's it's going to take some time you mentioned the tulku tradition and it's a really interesting one on the one from when I look at it from one angle, it's very sophisticated, like compared to uh, the Roman emperor dies and his son takes over. Right. That's a very dumb form of succession. It's much smarter to have a group of people go out intuitively and rationally find some kid that they think seems reasonably intact and intelligent, bring him back, uh, make him secure give him a lot of intellectual and meditative training, and then he gets to a point where he should be in charge of some things. You're like, that sounds really good. It's better than a lot of alternatives. But it's still in a sexist, ethnocentric, usually medieval mm -hmm. context, and that has limits that you can't get out of just by using that form of social transmission. And so I think about how you get more of the more of the feminine in there right and on from one angle it's it's a return to the way that the feminine and the ecological was already embedded in the shamanic traditions on which these things are based from another angle it's well you just have to have more actual women and, and different kinds of social protocols involved but there's also this possibility that certain kinds of philosophical articulations are more gender integrated or feminine friendly than others um do you think it's enough to to have more women involved or does there have to be this shift toward a form of thinking that is itself more mm, has more implicit femininity in it yeah that's a powerful question um and i would say that there is almost almost both um and that there's sort of uh, and and the and it's not just both in the sense of two different things um but like kind of in the same dynamic there's a sense in which um so i think for me a, a like a, a meaningful idea of a conception of of the feminine and the masculine is one derived from real social existence and real social practice and uh, we we can maybe you know abstract them into archetypal principles, but only once we derive from them from real praxis first. And I think the way in which uh, so the feminine for me exists only because the patriarchal circumstances which divide a male sphere of sociality from a female sphere of sociality and have and 
pres- in prescribing various ways of being and thinking based on those, you know, the the proper domains of, of the sexes that certain kinds of, you know, ways of thinking and being um, become gradually crystallized. And there's, a, there's the, the masculine way crystallizes because it's just, you know, when you have a bunch of guys thinking together all the time, over time, you know, the, the sort of the self-similarity starts to um, emerge. And I think the same thing with, with the feminine. Um, but at the same time, you know, if if you you know if you, if you follow my 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 um, idea that patriarchy plays a big role in this, that um, there's also there's a sense in which because women are put in a subordinated position, that there's an almost natural liberatory um, uh, aspect to uh, feminine thinking and being because um, it involves not just learning how to be in your proper place, but also struggling with the fact that there's something unwhole and wrong or 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 not fully true about that and whereas the masculine has more of an opportunity to be a little aloof and um you know you know it's not going to question its own privilege so it's not really going to question its own basic foundational assumptions and so uh, i find so um in a, in a way, I find the masculine tends to be more more positivistic in that sense, sort of just taking things for granted and building on top of that. Whereas the the masculine, the feminine, not necessarily outside of dichotomies, but is is constantly challenging them. And um, so, in that sense, um, I think. Uh, so, so this is sort of almost like an ancient state of affairs that that um, continues. Um, but the question of uh, how do we um, bring more of the feminine in, in these sort of these masculine um, uh, coded or a masculine dominant spiritual communities or, or traditions, it's, um, it's not just bringing more women in, but also recognizing that because of the position that women have been in, in society and in generations and, you know, women sharing women's wisdom with each other over generations that there is this this way of being and thinking that maybe not be eternally endowed with you know um, primordial qualities it might still be historically specific and contingent is still um, something that is going to help us um, continue to develop and heal because that that way of thinking and being is already about that because it's, it's sort of this wrestling with the dichotomy of like being whole but not uh, being allowed to um, express that wholeness, and so it's not just including more women, but also uh, helping people and men uh, learn from women how to perhaps think and be more like women, not to become women or replace the ma- feminine or uh, the replace the masculine with the feminine, because you know even the feminine from her own side knows she's historically contingent and um, part of a process of liberation. And once that liberation is achieved, um, there may not be any reason to, to speak of masculine and feminine in these dichotomous dualistic ways, um, except as, um, you know, our abstractions that um, don't really capture the fullness of, of of who we are. Um, yeah, at the same time, you know, similar to what I was saying about with the um, Madhyamaka analysis, you actually want to go through with the sort of dialectic. You don't want to just grasp at a conclusion in advance and forego the, the, the actual interrogation of all those positions. We don't want to just, um, you know, reach for gender non-duality and, and and call it a day if patriarchy still exists we still have to navigate through that duality in order to get out of it um and so that was my long-winded way of, of, of sort of answering your question i think it's 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 both more more women um being involved and allowing to speak but also in a way that shows that um they're not just offering one other alternative, but that, that there is something very uh, meaningfully important about this feminine way of uh, being and thinking that needs to be embraced by everyone. Um, not because it's inherently superior, but because it will get us out of the dualistic predicament that makes us ask the question in the first place. Nice. Well said. And right where you started, you said it's 
almost both and i thought boy i would pick up a book that was called almost both i would read that book <laughs> uh, you know one thing that came up for me uh, a minute ago was uh, i'm curious how you hold the notion of self in all this right there's a famous distinction between you know all oh, the hindus have atman and the buddhists have anatman even though it's more complicated than that they both sort of have both and then there's you know uh, there's ways of saying sure there's still selfhood in buddhism it's just that it's got component parts and it changes over time or things like that but then you throw in these philosophers and it's even more complicated like when you're going through life or when you're going through meditation are you an individual a non-individual a individual an ecosystem <laughs> what what is selfhood for you yeah i mean i mean it's hard to describe it's hard to answer that in in like a single general way i mean i can think about what a self mean to me as a queer person what does self mean to me as um you know a woman what does self mean to me as a buddhist what what does self mean to me as an artist and i feel like in um that that concept sort of changes character based on the context in which i'm thinking it um though i would say in general they they all have the commonality of sort of being hard to pinpoint exactly the the beginnings or the ends or the the boundaries yet still undeniably present um you know i um i'm not i'm not a um i'm not a fan of sort of you know assertorial declarations about the absence or the presence of the self i'm 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 more interested in that 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 liminal space where um you can't find the self but obviously you're trying to look for something and it's one of the most present things that you habitually uh, you know assume there is um and it's by um it's it's by um sort of really resting in or being comfortable in that liminality that um i think ironically the self really shines in as this sort of unfolding creative open-ended process um which is its own thing yet nothing without the great inheritance of you know everything before and around it um and so yeah but but the but the particular flavor in the way that um i think my self uh sort of concept um arises yeah it's more dependent on the um, is it the the buddhist side of me is it the artist side of me is it you know me as a woman and you know and i'm sure there's other ways i could think about it too but that i haven't you know me as a human you know um i like to think of my cat as a person i mean i is at this point it's like there's no way she's not a person <laughs> um and and uh, and and in a lot of ways like me i uh, I'm also, you know, part of her and she's a part of me. And so there's also that sense of self, um, non-human sense of self. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I don't think I've really answered your question, but. <laughs> no, but you, you made the move to uh, contextuality and plurality from my question, which was important. Sure. <laughs> I was, a couple of years ago, I was invited to go down to this uh, event at this monastery in Vermont, and it was a sort of a vet on like, how do we think what wisdom is? And I was uh, camping with my family and I, I like to put on a life jacket, just float around in the lake for hours. So I was out there trying Fine. to define what wisdom is. And after <laughs> like a couple hours, I thought I'm being way too general about this. I shouldn't be asking what wisdom is. I should be asking what is wisdom in a lake, <laughs> right? Like it's specific to the, yeah, the angle that you're coming in at, but there's something else about the way you describe that made me think of something I'd read of yours and, and this question, like, do you think, do you think the way process philosophy holds consciousness is too focused on human consciousness to allow them to have a full ecological project? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and I think it's it's sort of um sort of um relates to something I've been thinking about uh, a little bit recently is sort of the um 
the line between panpsychism and idealism and how, um, or even just like how panpsychism seems to be able to collapse into idealism or materialism, depending on who's wielding it. I mean, there are people who identify as physicalist as panpsychists, and there's also people who, um, <laughs> people like uh, Timothy Sprigg, who, um, you know, suggest that um, panpsychism is the way you get to absolute idealism. And so there's this sort of that, um, uh, what would you say, instability um, there. Um, I think this this is kind of like a, a tangent I was going to come back to. What was your question again? Sorry. <laughs> uh, my question is around, um, you know, like process approaches have a very sophisticated way of handling. Ah, to consciousness, consciousness. But, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, so yeah okay, now I remember. The human to be richly ecological. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and I guess, so the reason why, um, uh, so that relates to the materialism and idealism thing is that when when panpsychism tends towards idealism, uh, there's a sense in which everything becomes subsumed into like a, a singular kind of mind. It becomes a kind of a monism. And there's a risk there for sure, especially if you conceive of uh, consciousness as kind of, uh, the apex of the sort of uh, uh, continuum of subjectivity. And so you might say that, um, you know, even atoms and subatomic particles are, you know, experiencing and they have sort of proto-consciousness. Um, and then the more you come, however, you know, in whatever secret way, the more you combine and add these molecules into complex forms, you know, the complexity of their form might parallel the complexity of their proto-consciousness and that eventually gives rise to consciousness. Um, that sounds cool. That sounds ecological in the sense that you're, you know, you know, you're uh, allowing everything else to be, you know, sentient as well. But uh, there's a sense in which uh, you, it's a kind of um, monism disguised as pluralism when you characterize everything as sort of just a partial instance or a incomplete version of consciousness. And it kind of brings um, it all back to an anthropocentric perspective when when you were interested in decentering, you know, uh, anthropos. And um and so, and that criticism has been launched to to Whitehead by ecological thinkers before. And I mentioned that in my in my uh, introduction article to Process Buddhism that um, people can read in the Center for Process Studies blog. And um, but the but the thing is that when you read Whitehead, um, he's a, a little bit more, I always should say, a lot more nuanced than that. And, you know, people, um, especially early on, might grasp onto the sort of pan-experientialist side of Whitehead and overplay the role that consciousness plays in the system and um, not really... Um, uh, recognizing that what he's really emphasizing is this actually like precognitive way of experiencing, which is really based on what he calls feelings and more technically prehension, which is this way of almost somatically integrating other things into your own internal constitution before there's really this moment of, um, you know, conceptual or, um, um, reflection happening, or even before the ingression of conceptual ideas from the realm of eternal objects, there's that initial phase of conformal feeling where things are just taken in like um, somatically. And um, in, in that sense, experience is ubiquitous for Whitehead. And in that sense, I think um, um, at Whitehead is a very anthrodecentric thinker. Um, and so, so I think process philosophers should be careful about um, really what does it mean when Whitehead is saying or talking about experience and its ubiquity and the actual occasion being a drop of experience. And um, but at the same time, we um, you know someone might say, well, okay, well, even this category of feeling is too human bound, and you know, and, and you can't avoid. Um, you know, reducing uh, people to these concepts you have. Every time you say this or that, that the human has is actually ubiquitous in the cosmos, you're already being an anthropocentric. Um, well, there's this, there's a sense in which that's kind of true. in like, I think a necessary way, you know, um, I think one of the biggest contributions of Kant is, um, you know, 
regardless of whatever problems people might have with him, I think his critical turn and making us actually see that there's a significant way in which the way we apprehend the world is actually a world for us. Um, it's we want we don't want to accept that or sort of extrapolate that necessarily into the kind of absolute idealism that Hegel would you know do when he moved beyond Kant. Um, maybe we don't want to go that route, but we still want to be sensitive to the fact that uh, we don't want to be naive um, and just take things for granted as being objectively existent. Because the thing is, if Kant is right then when we're being naive, then we're that's when we're actually making the error because we're not critically self-aware that these appearances are actually appearances for me or for us. And Buddhism teaches the same thing, that um, much of the phenomenal appearances that we experience are functions of our karma though, that we've accumulated from the past. Um, and so, so that's important. So there's that balance where we need to say something in order to organize our thought, organize ourselves and do something about it, about the crisis that we're in, but also being sensitive of how we're articulating um, these relationships between human and non-human others and what are our similarities and what are our differences. Um, so yeah, and I, and I think process philosophy um, does a really good job in, in balancing that. But of course, you know, wherever there is... Um, a polarity, even within people who are trying to find the middle, there there's tendencies to to tip to one to the other, um, and that's just a natural part of being human, I guess. Yeah, I think there's uh, definitely Whitehead makes it possible to read into him a very rich variety of experience, right? Maybe makes mm -hmm. experience ubiquitous because you know, for something to show up in your world at all, to be counted as real, to be registered, is to be enfolded and interpreted and to, you know, have some kind of affective response one way or the other. But I'm curious how you think about um, what counts as an experiencer. So in, in the integral theory, there's this argument about holons versus heaps, right? And so it, it would sort of go, there's things that can be experiencers, there's a set and anything could be this way. Oh, a molecule, an atom, a quark, a cat. These are sets of things, and they can have subjective, intersubjective, and external reality. But not everything that you put into a concept would be of the same kind, right? So you'd say, well, a cat might be an experience or an atom because it has some kind of structural unity, but three halves of an atom and a pencil put in a bag doesn't necessarily make an independent experiencer it lacks some yeah. kind of structural component so you could say that i always think of this example which is maybe every molecule in a pile of dirt has some subjectivity but the pile of dirt might not have subjectivity because it's just a more or less haphazard concept we've imposed but um, what, what's your thinking about what would count as a unit that could be called an experiencer even if experience is ubiquitous yeah, that's a good question, and um, and I and I like this heap versus whole on distinction because yeah, it, it does sort of um, point to how um, even for um, for Whitehead, um, uh, you know, the basic unit of of experience of reality is, is the actual occasion, but um, but when we come to actual things like molecules and um, you know atoms, molecules and um, higher life forms, these are Integral, integral nexuses or nexus of actual occasions. And uh, what makes a nexus different, I think, from just an aggregate is that they all mutually prehend one another. So they incorporate each other into their own constitution. And in some sense, um, uh, you know, everything is kind of like foam in the sense that there really isn't individuals but there is more so concentrations so whitehead will talk about how in every actual actual occasion the entire universe is prehended and in, into that single totality but um but based on you know uh, proximity of relevance and so even if um you know even if this chapstick is you know this integrated unit here um the actual occasions in it still prehend the, the whole cosmos. Um, 
but the but the ones that actually come what we see as the ones that actually compose it are the more the more relevant ones but i mean is this chapstick a heap i mean that's probably um the case for sure um and in that sense i would say that um i think uh experiencers are not just um, composed of units that uh, mutually prehend one another or mutually include one another, um, but are also, uh, in, to some extent, responsive and adaptive. Um, and, um, you know, atoms are responsive, responsive and adaptive um, in a very, you know, minimal sense, um, probably the most minimal sense. Um, and so are animals and things and, and you know, and maybe when chemicals relate um, relate to one another, when the way that they exchange electrons and stuff, maybe that too. It's an interesting question. I haven't thought a whole lot, but my my intuition would be anything that is responsive and adaptive, um, because that's just an extension of his holonic character of actually being composed of parts that are mutually prehending one with one another, which is a, another way of kind of saying you know uh, responding and adapting to each other over time. Given that Whitehead and Deleuze might provide us with some intellectual tools whereby we can think the production of subjectivity in a way that eludes the trap of correlationism to which Meliso points, what music are you into lately? <laughs> yeah, um, let's see. I've been listening to a lot of like uh like ambient down tempo kind of things um idm i think is another label for it uh it's it's kind of hard to um really describe but it's like sort of like sonic landscapes uh soundscapes sorry that um still have like a lot of rhythm but very spacey and cosmic i mean i would say that's like uh 60% of what I listen to because I find that I can listen to it while reading because it's it's subtle enough that it doesn't um, distract me from what I'm reading, but it it, it has a, enough of a beat to keep me engaged. Um, and um, so I do that. I mean, that's when I read most things. I can't read Whitehead and listen to any music, even, even this kind of really nice stuff. But um yeah, I mean, uh, some of my favorite artists are uh, like Mig Tech, uh, AS Dana, uh, um, Carbon Based Life Forms. Um, the aesthetics around these people are also really interesting. They they are they also sort of a lot of their aesthetics also suggest um, sort of liminality and um, sort of going beyond the duality of like the technical and the biological or the cosmic and the terrestrial. So. Um, I'm naturally attracted to that kind of music. And now that I'm talking about it, it kind of makes sense. <laughs> but also I've been like listening to a lot of like, um, like hyper pop playlists and um, some break core has been interesting to sort of thing. Um, recently been kind of jamming to this K-pop playlist um, I found recently. Yeah, stuff like that. Um, a lot of, a little bit of everything um, in that remaining like 30%, but then like 70% is a lot of this ambient stuff. Yeah, I've uh, definitely carbon-based life forms comes up in my algorithms a lot. Uh, mm. I've got a little I've got a, like a playlist that I listen to when I'm in the car or when I'm about to go into a, a Zoom conversation or something like that. And it has like this thing cycle in and cycle out. And some are songs I've been carrying with me for 20 years and some are more recent. I've got a lot of Courtney Barnett and Kiki Rockwell on that list lately. But in general, uh, I put on ambient or like isochronic gamma waves or something like mm -hmm. that or because you know, I think... Uh, I want it to be good for the kids' brains when they're walking around the house, but also I need something to listen to when I'm writing more so than when I'm reading. And uh, so it has to be something with essentially no words uh, right. that yeah, same. activates uh, relaxed concentration, but also gives me a feeling of either sort of a, a cosmic expanse or like a haunting archaic mood. I'm, I'm sort of following both of those vibes. For sure. I'm um, actually I remembered that um someone I've been kind of obsessed about lately is um John Hopkins. 
I don't know if you've um, heard of him, but he's like a little bit, um, it's definitely his sounds are similar to the, the ambient soundscape stuff I was talking about, but maybe a little bit more orchestral, but I mean, I'm, uh, maybe that's the wrong word, but um, it, much more complex in his organization and much more, the beat is stronger. Um, but he, he works a lot with, um, just a lot of micro textures and, and micro fluttering in in his sounds. Um, I, I've seen an interview of his a few years ago, and I remember I think he does a lot of like sampling um, stuff from real life, like textures and stuff like that, really crisp. Um, I've been listening to his new Ritual album while uh, rereading the Marks and Whitehead um, book for the for the reading group, and it just goes really well with uh, the parts when I'm reading about Whitehead because it's like the way that some of the sounds flutter in and out but are still part of this sort of unfolding uh, wave of sounds. Um, it really feels a lot like, uh, you know, Whitehead's process in reality. So um, totally I would ch uh, check out John Hopkins and especially his most recent album. I've been listening to that a lot. Um. What about your romantic life? Too personal or anything you want to share? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I've been kind of single-ish lately and enjoying that. Um, I'm in a very busy time of my life and haven't been... Um, it's, it's been a really freeing year, actually. It's been the first year that I have been sort of just um, working on myself and not seeking out partners. Um, but that might also be because um, uh, my last relationship was interesting and maybe uh, involved in a way that uh, makes me hesitant to um, involve myself too deeply with anyone. Um, at, at this point, um, I'm very much sort of Seek, if I'm seeking at all, I'm seeking to settle down. I'm kind of exhausted with the ebb and flow of like dating. And, and especially nowadays, it feels harder to date. It feels like people are more, more interested in like hooking up and stuff like that. And just like casual encounters, which can be fun, but... I don't know. Like, I'm, I feel like I'm too busy to do that kind of stuff. So I have my eyes set on, you know people who I might be willing to settle down with. And I'm not sure if I've really found the people. Um, but and it's hard because, um, I don't know, it's hard to find people who are into the kind of stuff I am sometimes um, and and can uh, and hold space for, <laughs> for me um, with regards to all of that. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. There is someone I have a crush on. Um, and they are they live far away unfortunately and i think they like me but i think we're both i think we're both hesitant to make any kind of flirtatious move because we highly respect each other as people and friends and we don't want to fuck that up <laughs> so which is already a good sign <laughs> yeah, yeah i, I like i like sign. people like that yeah <laughs> Okay, well, I guess we're coming to the end of this. Uh, I've had a lot of fun. I feel like I like Me you. Too. And uh, <laughs> if we did this again, what do you think are three other thinkers we could use as the excuse to have a conversation? Well, definitely Marx. Um, okay. I have not really been um, explicit in um, either my blog or my writing yet about the, the role that Marx plays in my thought. Um, and that's because um, I like to sort of, I like to read someone before I try to use them too much. And um, I have read, I'm still working on finishing the capital volumes. Um, and so I read the first one, a little bit of the second one, but trying to get through his whole, um, not his whole oeuvre, um, but just like some of the core texts um, before I really start integrating him into my writing. But I would I would still love to talk about Marx and, and how much of a role he plays in the way I think about things. Probably um, a, a feminist thinker. Like uh, I'm, I'm, I've been really interested in ecofeminism lately, as you might know. Uh, Val Plumwood is a really good person, or Ariel Sale is a really good person. Maybe Marx with Ariel Sale would be great because Ariel Sale is kind of a is very much a um, ecofeminist who comes from the uh, Marxist feminist tradition. Um, so that would be cool. 
and um, maybe maybe another Buddhist person like um, like Mipam or Longchenpa, and and that could be a way of talking a little bit about my own spiritual practice and how the, how they relate to that. So, um, but not not limited to that. We can talk about other people too. Um, okay well those will be in the mix i'll think about whether there's some i would like to go into but let's do that let's have another three person conversation because uh i really like where this is going thanks very much for talking to us yeah thank you thank you for having me bye-bye